I was just thinking during the uh, budget presentation, what a blessing it is to be a part of a church that gives so generously. And isn't it wonderful, instead of having to hear, you need to give more, you're not giving enough, for uh, the uh, deacons to be able to stand and say, you gave just right, and you gave more than just right. It's a blessing. So thank you for your generous spirit. It's allowed us to do a, a lot of good things. I th- appreciate our elders and our deacons in preparing, putting together the budget. Uh, it's not extravagant, but uh, it is generous, and it takes care of the needs of our community and of our church. And I think it's, it's great. So congratulations, good job, men, on preparing that, and congregation on your great giving this past year. Also, before we get, in, get into the lesson, I know it's 20 till 12 or till 11, so uh, I'm going to shorten my lesson just a little bit. But I, I did want to uh, introduce the new, newest parts of our congregation. And so uh, the Presleys are here with their twins who've been in the hospital and uh, now are back home. And so I'd like for you guys to stand and let us see your new babies. Turn around so everybody can see them. So there you go. Congratulations. Wow. If you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, please. Matthew chapter 4. We're studying the book of Matthew, and we're trying our best to apply Matthew to our everyday lives. You hear that a lot in the prayers that are offered from this pulpit and also in, in Bible classes. And so I thought it would be good to prepare a series of lessons where we actually emphasize the idea of applying Matthew to our everyday lives. Verse 12, when he heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And to those who were sitting in the land of the shadow of death, upon them dawned a light. And from that time Jesus began to preach saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left the nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the boat and their father and followed him. And Jesus was going about in all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him went out into all Syria and they brought to him all who were ill, taken with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And great multitudes followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. I want us to consider now a few ideas from this passage of scripture. The first is this. The time was right for Jesus to start his ministry. The time was right. Notice these time phrases. From that time Jesus began to proclaim... Let's go back to the slide before. And the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus knew the time had come. This is the time for me to begin my ministry. The baptism which we studied a couple of weeks ago and the temptations we studied last week, Jesus now knew the time had come. And so I got to thinking, you can't buy time. You can't sell it. You can't rent it. You can't borrow it, you can't save it, you can't multiply it, and you can't modify it. I wonder if we polled everyone in here, if there would be anyone who would say that time hasn't passed swiftly in their life. 
it's hard for me to even fathom that I've lived here and been your preacher for 15 years. Can you believe that? 15 years. It's a long time. But it went fast. My children have grown up here. I've watched many of your children grow up and leave and now are married and have kids. And if we went around and talked to every person in the room, everyone could have a story about how it seems their life has gone by quickly and how things seem to speed up all the time. Time is fleeting. And so I think if we are going to apply this section of Scripture and we think about Jesus saying the time has come, I wonder if it would be good for us to say, what has the time come for me to do? How long will I put off the decision to become a Christian? When will that time be to be baptized into Christ, to claim Him as the Lord of my life? How long will I hold on to some conflict I have with someone else in this room? When will the time be to make that right? When will the time be for me to put aside some sin that I've been unwilling to relinquish from my life? When will that time be? When will the time be to be restored and to be faithful to God again or to renew my commitment to faithfulness to Him? And on and on we could go through questions in our lives of things that we have put off or things that we have procrastinated to doing, thinking, I'll do it when I get to this stage in my life or I'll do it when I get to that stage in my life. And suddenly, as we know, time is fleeting. All the stages of life are gone and we never did it. Galatians 4.4 4 says, When the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman. When it was the right time, Jesus came. So when is the right time for me? And remember, as we looked at last Sunday night in our lesson, that delay is a tactic of the devil. And so as we feel then the urge to do what God wants us to do while we have the time to do it, Satan always wants us to delay knowing what we should do, so we'll never do it. And it's his goal for us to continue to put off and to put off and to put off until we either don't care anymore or we're no longer here. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? And I use this scripture only to illustrate that time may allow for a lot of things except for the most important things that we continue to put off. And what good is it if we take care of many things but neglect the most important things, the things of the soul? I've always been drawn to this phrase because I think it says so much. It was accredited to Queen Elizabeth I, who in her dying breath said, All my possessions for a moment of time. She could purchase anything in her life except the one thing that wasn't for sale, and that's time. What is it time for you to do? Number two, the world needs the light. I like Isaiah's words here from Matthew 4, 16. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land and the shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. I like the contrast of dark and light because it's something we can all relate to. We've all stumped our toe on something in a dark room. We've all done it. We all understand how scary the darkness can be sometimes in some places. We all can understand how much easier it is to drive on a country road in the daylight than it is in the dark. And so as we think about the contrast between light and darkness, we all can relate to it in such a way to know that there's a great peace and relief in light that isn't there in darkness. And we must not lose sight then of the idea that when the gospel is brought to people in the world and even to ourselves, 
It is a great relief because it is light and darkness. It shines in such a way that not only does it reveal the sin in our lives that needs to be uh, forgiven, but it also changes our lives. So I've written here, in order to appreciate light, we must understand the liberation from darkness. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, understanding and knowing what it is to be forgiven makes us appreciate the light and what it has done for us. The world needs the light. There's an um, oil on canvas painting that was done by William Holman Hunt. It hangs in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. It's called The Light of the World. It's a very beautiful, it's kind of washed out there, but it really is quite beautiful. There's a door there with some uh, a growth of weeds all at the door, and he's holding the lantern. There you go. And there are some ideas up about it that I think are really striking. The first is the gentle light in the darkness. The idea of the, the humble knock of Jesus at the door, which represents a man's heart. The fact that on this, that the, the handle is on the inside of the door. The, the door can only be opened from within of the person. And then the weeds gathering at the door, which shows how long it has been since that heart has been closed off and shut. Jesus makes the shadow of darkness flee. And as he holds up his lantern, he reveals the light which pierces our own hearts and minds with the knowledge of his love. Listen, folks. The world needs the light. And if we put that with the idea of the fleetingness of time, how time is fleeting, we understand how much there is to do and how time marches on. That each day as it goes by, it gives us less time to do the things that God wants us to do. Not only to repent of the things in our own lives that need to be changed, but also to take the light to the world which lives in darkness. In him, Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And so God sent John. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, that is John, but came that he might bear witness of the light. There was a true light which was coming into the world, enlightening every man. A scripture I really love too with regards to light is this one from Acts chapter 17. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. I guess I like this because I like the word grope. It, it really is this dark uh, kind of a person being in darkness and they can't see and they're groping around and they're trying to find the way. It gives that imagery to me. But God has, has set the boundaries and he set the, the determined people's lives in order to create a path for them to be able to reach out and to find him. And that's what he wants. And so for us as his people, must help them to find that light, to light their way to find Jesus. The world needs the light, and I need the light. Number three, we marvel at, as we apply this gospel in Matthew chapter 4, because the disciples left everything. It's a challenge for us then. Because a lot of times we want to say that we would leave everything, but I wonder if we really would. In Matthew 4, upon their calling, the Bible says immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Immediately. That's astonishing to me. And they left their father there in, in the boat. 
I like Zebedee. Because there's no record in Scripture that Zebedee objected. So you think about it in terms of uh, the father who allowed his children to go. That says something about him as well. So we marvel at the faith of these disciples who left everything, but we also marvel at the father who let them go. There's no Bible record of them saying, now wait a minute, you've got to help me clean up all this stuff. You can't just walk out of here. That's what I'd probably do. But uh, they, he has the faith, it appears here, to let them go. Now there were many things they could have reflected on. You know, if I leave, I'm going to lose my job. If I leave, my income's going to be affected. My home. What about my parents? What about my family? What about an uncertain future? But none of these troubled the brothers. They immediately abandoned all else and followed. It's a powerful message for us. Are we ready to drop everything to follow Jesus? Turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 for just a minute. I, just, I really like this passage, and it almost teaches it from the negative side, but I think it's a powerful concept. Beginning in verse 40 of Mark 1, And a leper came to him, beseeching him, and falling on his knees before him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And moved with compassion, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news, such to an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter the city, but stayed out in unpopulated areas, and they were coming to him from everywhere. Now usually when we read this, we we emphasize Jesus' compassion, we emphasize the brilliance of the healing. But I want you to notice something behind the story. Behind the story was a strong, sterning directive that Jesus gave to him. Don't tell anyone. Simple. Don't tell anyone. But he goes out and does it anyway. Simple obedience. You've, you've enjoyed this healing that I've given to you. Now don't tell anyone. And there were consequences to that lack of obedience. He went out and proclaimed it freely and spread the news to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter the city. Now he may have thought that what he was doing was better than what Jesus asked him to do. But the truth is, what we want to do is never better than what Jesus asked us to do. And then we must always practice a simple obedience. And if, if God commands us through his word to do something, we do it because it's simple obedience. That's part of discipleship. So as we are amazed at these, these men who Jesus said to them, follow me, and simply they obeyed and they went with him and followed him. And such is true for us. Follow me. Repent. Be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Leave all to follow me. Confess me before men. Teach the gospel to others. Simple directives that come from scripture that are simply to be obeyed. And that's why we marvel at them. What will I give up for Jesus? And will I practice simple obedience? Next, the Lord changes lives. The Lord changes lives. Notice here in Matthew 4, 24. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. When the light is shown into the lives of people, and they know Christ, their lives change. In Luke 4, we find uh, even more descriptive words about this kind of impact that Jesus has upon the lives of men. 
He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, and to proclaim the favor, uh, favorable year of the Lord. When Jesus comes into a person's life, when he knocks at the door and they open the door, when they obey him simply in what he tells them to do, when they understand the interests of time and how time is fleeting and that there's no time to delay, their lives are changed forever. Have I allowed Jesus to change my life? Really? So long as the door stays closed and the weeds grow at the entrance to the door, my heart will never change. Finally, in this lesson, as we apply it to our everyday lives, I'd like for you to consider that Christianity is more than words. Christianity is more than words. In Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent is more than saying, I'm sorry. It's too easy to just say sorry. Repenting means so much more. It encompasses reviewing what has happened in the past, analyzing, regretting mistakes, and making a firm decision to do better in the future. It is thus an active word. The things we say with our mouths are always proved genuine by watching the response of our lives. And so repenting is a change not only of my attitude, but of the way that I live my life that is evident to others. And notice with regards here to Jesus and his ministry, verse 23 says, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Jesus not only blessed others through the proclamation of his words, but through the actions of his life in making their lives better. He didn't just say, I have compassion on you. He healed them. He didn't just see that they were lost and teach them. He was the light and acted in such a way as to give his life for them on a cross. All the words that Jesus spoke were proven true in the activities and actions of his life. John writes in 1 John 3, If anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need but closes his eyes to his need, how can God's love reside in him? Little children, we must not love with words or speech but with truth and with action. And so I wonder, do I love only with my words? Now I want you to think this morning for a moment. Is there something it's time for you to do? Time is fleeting. I wonder, what is it time for me to do? Remember, the devil wants you to, to, to delay, to put it off, and to not act. But true Christianity is always more than just words. It's the actions of our lives. You think about these things as we stand and sing this song. Will you come if you need to as we sing? <laughs>